Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors. Today, we're talking to the award-winning financial historian, Sebastian Malaby, an author of the newly released book, The Power Law, drawing on unprecedented access to the most celebrated venture capitalists of all time, Sebastian tells the story of our beloved tribe of VC finances. Stay tuned to hear the stories behind the most fabled VC firms and startups as you've never heard them before. Want to be on top of who the best up and coming emerging VCs in Europe are and maybe even invest with them? Register for our newsletter at theemergingvc.substack.com and be the first to get in the know. Hi, Sebastian. Welcome to the European VC. How are you today? I'm great. Great to be with you. Awesome. It's our pleasure. Before we start, I want to take some time to hear a bit about you and to our audience. It's very interesting for us to be doing this with Sebastian because he just launched end of Jan, if I'm not mistaken. He just launched a super interesting book called The Power Law. So before going there, Sebastian, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what led you to write this book. Well, by background, I'm a journalist. I left Oxford University, joined The Economist magazine and was sent to be the Africa correspondent. I was outside Nelson Mandela's jail when he came out of prison in 1990. And it was so exciting. I thought my career would be downhill thereafter. Nothing nothing could match that excitement. <laughs> but it turns out that life has plenty of excitements. And I stayed with The Economist, wrote about finance in London for a bit, went to Japan in the early 90s at a time when there was this kind of cartoon effect where the figure runs over the cliff and is still peddling furiously, but doesn't realize there's nothing under his feet and he's about to collapse. So that was Japan's economy at the time. People were still super optimistic about Japan because it had done so well in the 1980s. By 1992, the signs of trouble were clearly there. Everything had crashed, but there were those who thought that it would recover. And so I witnessed that period when Japan came to terms with the fact that it was no longer the most dynamic economy in the world. And then I went to the US and spent what I thought would be a sort of three to four year stint with The Economist, but I wound up joining the Washington Post, writing a weekly column, and then sort of getting the book writing bug. I'd done one book about South Africa in my 20s, but then I switched to making that really my main focus. I wrote a book about the World Bank, a book about the history of hedge funds called More Money Than God, a book about uh, central banking in the form of a biography of Alan Greenspan. And so now my book on venture capital, which is called The Power Law, it's my fifth book. If I look back on the last three anyway, they are different slices of financial history going roughly from the 1960s to today. So I've done the hedge funds, I've done the central banking, now I'm doing the technology investing, and it's been a lot of fun. And I can say that reading it, has also been a lot of fun. I have been laughing. I always listen to the books as audiobooks, and I've really been laughing when listening to some of the stories there. I have to say you've written what I think is the best and most engaging and hilarious account of how VC came to be. But I think that that many actually don't know the origin story of VC. So I'd love to hear you just give us that historical rundown and go as in-depth as you please. We're here to listen and have fun about this. Sure. Well, you know, you can take the story back a hugely long way if you really want to. You know, the idea of carried interest and a risky enterprise is said to go back to European sea captains who would be sponsored to go and sail to the New World and bring back silver or other precious goods, and they would get to keep some of what they carried, um, maybe 20%. And that was sort of the origin of carried interest. And then, you know, people tell a similar story about whaling in Nantucket. I don't really get into that in my version of the history. I'm more interested in the post-Second World War. After the Second World War in the United States, there were a few experiments in 1946 uh, that began on the East Coast. So the Rockefeller family, the Whitney family, another rich family. And the most important was American research and development 
a, a kind of economic development initiative launched with by grandees of the New England economy. So somebody who was on the board of MIT and somebody who was a leader at the Boston Fed, and they recruited a Harvard Business School professor called George Dorio to lead this thing. And what all these projects had in common is that they were really more about philanthropy and sort of economic development as a public good than they were about trying to actually make money. And for one reason or another, and I think not trying to make money front and central is a big reason, <laughs> they didn't really become the model that other people followed. So, <laughs> you know, Dario had some fantastic investments with American research and development. Famously, he backed DEC, uh, digital equipment company, I guess it stood for, in 1957, which was a massive return for him, pretty much made his fund. So that was an early example of the power law where something in the tail of the distribution drives most of the returns. So Doria was not a complete failure, but he chose to list his fund as a public company. That turned out to be a bad move. There was always a discount in the share value of his fund and the underlying assets because the market didn't really value what he was up to. If the point of venture capital is to kind of go for value and you're not actually being valued yourself <laughs> as you should be, given what you've got in your portfolio. It doesn't really make sense. So um, American Research and Development was disbanded in the early 70s, and nobody copied that model. In the meantime, okay, swivel away from the east coast of the United States to the west coast, you have this improbable story of Arthur Rock, who was by origin a slightly shy, inward-looking and kind of unprepossessing New York stockbroker who heard about eight scientists at some semiconductor company in Silicon Valley, which of course then was not Silicon Valley, it was, it was just California. And Arthur Rock flew out to meet these eight scientists who wanted to leave their company. It was called Shockley Semiconductor, and the boss, William Shockley, was a brilliant Nobel Prize winner, but an absolutely terrible and tyrannical guy to work for. So these eight scientists, they kind of were unhappy there, and they wanted to go and be hired as a group by somebody else. That was their idea. And Arthur Rock dropped this bombshell. He said, don't go work for other people. Start your own company. And they're like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? We, we, you know, this is the 1950s. People don't do that kind of thing. This is the era of organization man, right? That was the famous book about the 1950s business culture. You're supposed to work loyally for one company and you do it for a long time. You rise up the hierarchy and then you retire with a gold watch. Okay, that's, that's what American business people do. Yeah. What, what, what do you mean, start our own company? And the funny thing that the people who said this included Gordon Moore, who, of course, was one of these eight scientists, but then later founded Intel with Bob Noyce. Yeah. So you'd have thought, okay, this is the archetypical entrepreneur. He absolutely has risk in his blood. He <laughs> wants to go and found companies. Not at all. That is historically inaccurate, as it turns out. What happened instead was that this guy, Arthur Rock, shows up in California from New York and says, you should start your own company. And they're like, what do you mean? And he says, well, you know, I'll raise the money for you, and, and then you get to own shares in your own company, and if you do well, you get rewarded based on your own talent. It was sort of a radical idea. And they said, but we need quite a lot of money. We might need, you know, three quarters of a million. And Arthur Rock said, well, I'll get you more than a million. <laughs> and then their eyes kind of, you know, lit up with dollar signs. And, and they said, okay, well, <laughs> all right then, uh, you're on. And that was the first, what I call liberation, you know, liberation capital. Venture capital was liberation capital. Yeah. It liberated talent from hierarchies. And from that moment on, Anybody, engineers, marketing people, hustlers, artistic dreamers could meet and combine and collaborate and form these teams that could be super creative around new ventures. And I think that's the real origin story of venture capital as we know it today.
Now we heard just about Arthur Rock, who's of course someone who many people know, but there's also two other firms that everyone knows, Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins, and they play a central role in all of this, of course. So I think that if you'd give us the founding story there, I think that would be amazing. And it's of course uh, also the story of uh, activism capital and the tranching of investment. So I- I'd love to dive into this. So just the timeline here is that Arthur Rock funded the Traitorous Eight, which gave rise to Fairchild Semiconductor in 1957. Then that worked out really well for him. So he started a, the first West Coast successful venture fund. There'd been one small antecedent, but his was the first to really do well. That was 1961. And in the process, he invented a couple of tools in venture. You know, one is you only ever use equity, right? You invest and you take equity in the company. You as the GP has equity because you have the carry. Your LPs, of course, are rewarded in equity. The founder of the company has equity in the company. And importantly, the employees get equity. So it's equity, 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 equity. And that was, you know, sounds obvious now, but it was radical at the time. People were trying to do venture with debt and and so forth. And then the second thing that Arthur Rock understood and preached and realized is that this is all about, you know, the tail outcomes. It's all about you know, getting that 10x or 20x. His own fund did that, the one in 1961. And so this skewed distribution of returns, which then leads you to reach for the upside by really going for the potential breakout companies, that was another Arthur Rock insight, which he showed others how to do. Okay, so now you're talking about Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins. They started out, both of them, in 1972, right? So this is now 10, 12, 15 years after Rock was getting going. And they brought two further innovations into venture capital, as you were saying. The first idea was activism. Roll your sleeves up and get involved in the company. And a good way to illustrate this is the funny story of Sequoia's first investment, which was in Atari, the pioneering video game company. It made this thing called Pong, which was not about the smell, kind of like ping pong, right? You had this ball that was moving slowly across your video screen and you had to toggle the paddle up and down and avoid missing the ball and then you would get a high score. The the instructions (laughs) were, were exactly as simple as that. So you could put this game in a bar and it didn't matter how drunk you were, you could still have fun playing it, right? So this, this game uh, achieved product market fit with inebriated bar goers. And Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia, saw that it had product market fit, saw that, you know, you could make some money off this new technology, that video games could be a thing. But he also saw that the culture of Atari was going to be a little tricky, right? So he went to visit the factory, which was in this disused skating rink, and he had trouble breathing. And the founder of Atari, who was this sort of shaggy-haired, six-foot, five-inch guy called Nolan Bushnell, said, gee, you know, what's the matter with you? The founder of Sequoia, Don Valentine, was a fit guy. He played water polo for the Navy. He was not to be messed with, but he was gasping and panting. And the RE said, you know, gee, whatever they're smoking in this factory, it's not my brand because the thing, you know, the air was just thick with marijuana smoke. That was just one example of the way that Atari was functioning or possibly dysfunctioning. (laughs) You know, organization man had given way to disorganization man. And there were beer taps all over the office. You had your board meeting in a hot tub when Don Valentine was being asked to evaluate Atari. He was, you know, invited to the board meeting and he had to take his clothes off and get into the hot tub. (laughs) Luckily, because he was a water polo player, this business about showing off your chest was actually an advantage for him. (laughs) Uh, He was not intimidated at all, whereas the guy from Fidelity, who was also casing out Atari, was kind of shy and kept his white shirt and his tie on (laughs) and sat off to the side, and he did not do that investment. (gasps) Basically, Don Valentine had the personality, the stature, the physical and intellectual force to take on this hot tub culture and to turn it, you know, just by being tough, into something where... There were actually accounts, and you looked after the money, and, <laughs> and you, you know, partnered with a serious company like Sears to try to sell your product. And so he introduced the bell-bottomed engineers at Atari to the suit-wearing East Coast business guys from Sears, which was a huge retailer at the time. And he turned that into a real company uh, through activism. And then it was sold for a pretty good outcome. That was the Sequoia story, and I think and also a Terry with it. I think that what I said just before we joined this interview, that I don't think that anyone 
browsing on Sequoia's website and sees the Atari team there, imagines that this is the story that's behind that picture. <laughs> so I think that this is incredibly enlightening. And I think that there's another firm that, that we just mentioned before that we should also dive a bit into, which is Kleiner Perkins. So do tell us the origin story there as well. Right. So again, they got started in 1972. One of the founders, Eugene Kleiner, in fact, had been one of the traitorous eight who got funded by Arthur Rock. So there was that DNA that was carrying over. And then Tom Perkins was the other founder. He was the first venture capitalist who was happy to act as a flamboyant pitch man. You know, he loved nothing better than to roar up to the front of some dilapidated startup, which was kind of eking out a living in his brand new red Ferrari and, you know, act as the king. And he kind of was the king of Silicon Valley. He'd already done his own startup, which he'd been successful at. And he'd also been the, I think he was head of the computer division at Hewlett Packard, which is sort of the it company in the Valley at the time. So he was a big figure and he teamed up with Eugene Kleiner. They founded this company. And initially it did not go terribly well. The first fund included some investments in a company called Snow Job. Uh, and if yeah. the name sounds a bit suspicious, it was. The idea was that you would convert motorbikes into snowmobiles. And right after they did this investment, the uh, oil price shock came and it wasn't so easy to get <laughs> fuel for your snowmobile. So that didn't go so well. But what did go well was two bets. The first was Tandem Computer, which created a new kind of computer architecture that essentially was fail-safe because there were backup circuits that would click in if the first one went wrong. And then even more spectacularly and interesting, there, there was Genentech. Genentech being the first biotechnology company to get funded in the Valley, the maker of artificial insulin using recombinant DNA. And what's illuminating, I think, about Genentech is the way that it was funded stage by stage, this tranched financing that you referred to. Because at the beginning of Genentech, the founders came to Tom Perkins and said they needed half a million dollars just to kind of test the concept of whether recombinant DNA technology could be used to make an actual medicine that would be used in people. And this was a very radical and untested proposition. There was huge technical risk. And half a million dollars in the 1970s was real money. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like too much of a long shot. So what Tom Birkin said was, look, I'll give you 100,000 to start with, and you have to use that 100,000 to take on the toughest risks, what he called the white-hot risks. And if you can get past those risks and show that these can be overcome, then you'll be set up to raise the next tranche at a better valuation for you and less risk for me. So you'll get less dilution, so it's good for the entrepreneur. It's also good for me, the venture capitalist, because I'm taking less risk. I can't afford to take a half a million risk on a, a super risky project up front. So they agreed on this stage-by-stage -stage financing. It really meant that you could attack what Perkins called the White House risk, and if you failed, you would fail cheaply, but if you succeeded, it would be better for both sides, and that proved to be a wonderful outcome with a glorious IPO about three years later, which really put Climate Perkins on the map as the hot VC company of the 80s and 90s. And these successes are the fund returners that, you know, they're still fabled. <laughs> because, uh, there's so many that do 60x and so on on the funds now. So that's amazing. I think that there's one last story before we start jumping into some of the uh, super cool quotes that are in the book. And that is you enlightening to us exactly what is the magic behind Silicon Valley and why VC ended up working there and it didn't in the Boston area around MIT where you could say that there's just as many uh, stellar researchers there, there's just as strong universities, Howard, MIT, and so on. So what was the magic of Silicon Valley that allowed it to succeed there? Yeah, so there's a great debate about this East Coast versus West Coast thing because as you say, if you go back to the 50s and 60s and even 70s, clearly Boston was stronger than Silicon Valley when it came to tech. The military-industrial complex with the military pumping money into tech was mostly a story about MIT, founding you know, labs like Lincoln Labs spun out of MIT, which was explicitly a military lab. Defense contractors like Raytheon were born out of MIT. 
And so although people have said, oh, you know, the secret source about Silicon Valley is defense dollars, yeah, there were defense dollars that went into the West Coast, but more went to the East Coast. So if that really was the driver, you wouldn't expect Silicon Valley to be eclipsing Boston. And then people say, well, it was Stanford. Well, that's not true either, because MIT was stronger for a long time, and Harvard was stronger than Berkeley, so that's not the differentiating factor. So then people say, oh, well, I mean, it's, the, it's something in the water or in Silicon Valley, or you breathe it in the air, or, you know, it goes back to the gold rush of 1849 when, you know, people took a lot of risk, and there was a kind of West Coast free spirit and so forth. Well, I don't completely discount that. It's one of those allegations that's impossible to disprove. Mm-hmm. But what I do argue and what I feel very confident about is that people take risk when venture capitalists are there to underwrite it. And I show in, you know, quite fun, vivid detail, I hope, how that really did transform Silicon Valley, just changed the whole culture of the place. When venture capital, after the Genentech IPO, after the Apple IPO, both of them in 1980, really took off as an asset class and people started to put more money into venture funds. So the sheer number of venture partners running around the valley started to, you know, double and quadruple. It just changed the feeling of the whole place because suddenly if you wanted to start a business, you could leave a company and you could raise money and you could do it quickly and you could do it on reasonably good terms. And so this liberation, which was an extraordinary miracle when Arthur Rock first did it in the 50s and 60s, became kind of just normal. People assumed that if you were a bright engineer with a great idea, yeah, of course you would get funded. And not only that, you would also get to hire the first five engineers, super talented people that you needed to be in your company. And you could kind of make alliances with other startups They would treat you right. You could have competition, but also cooperation at the same time. So that cooperation. Now, where did all that stuff come from? People say, well, it's just the Valley's culture. Actually, this was sort of policed in an informal way by venture capital. And a good story about this came in the early 1980s when in the way that venture capitalists did then and still do, you know, if you have two companies that are competing head to head, and they're kind of bleeding each other, then maybe a merger makes more sense. That's what happened with PayPal and X.com in the 2000s, quite famously. This was already happening in the 1980s a bit. But obviously, if you're going to try and do a tie-up and one company gets to see the intellectual property of the other company and then the tie-up doesn't work, there has to be some informal rule that you're not just going to rip off the other guy's intellectual property. And there was a moment which was quite revealing when this informal rule was violated, where John Doerr, who of course became the absolute king of internet investing in the 1990s, had introduced two companies, Angama Bass and Silicon Compilers. And he suggested that they should work together. Angama Bass had decided after a while that Silicon Compilers didn't have what it needed. And so it had broken off the collaboration. And then Silicon Compilers ripped off some of those ideas and took them to a, a rival of Ungham and Bass. So at this point, Ungham and Bass just, you know, flips out, said that's a violation of all of the informal rules of the valley. And in appealing over this issue, it didn't go to the water because it was drinking something in the water. It didn't go to the air because it was breathing something in the air. No, it went to the head office of Kleiner Perkins, where John Doerr worked, and said, listen, you guys screwed us over. You did this introduction. We shared our IP because we trusted you guys because you made the introduction. Now our IP might be stolen. We don't accept this. This is, this is an outrage. Tom Perkins, who was presiding over this meeting with his, you know, in his beautiful office looking over the San Francisco Bay through these massive great you know, windows, you know, he was kind of the king of Silicon Valley, the imperial Solomon-like judge. <laughs> and so he was sitting in judgment over this dispute. And he asked Ungman Bass and its leaders to leave the room for a bit while he deliberated with John Doerr and his partners. And they decided that they had to pay compensation. And so they asked Ungman Bass, well, what do you need? And they named what they thought was an outrageous amount of money. And Perkins just said, okay, you got it. And they were basically willing to pay this large amount of money because it mattered to preserving their reputation as the arbiters of free and fair 
collaboration slash competition, that co-opetition. And so I think that really illustrates how venture capitalists were the guardians of the productive network that explain why Silicon Valley did so well. And you just didn't have that in Boston. It was just a different type of venture capital, less risk-taking, more interested in term sheets that try to protect the investor. It is a great story about how Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, was desperate to raise money from Boston VCs and ran around for a long time trying to do that. But every time there was the oh, by the way syndrome. <laughs> oh, by the way, we said we would fund you, but we need you to find uh, some other investor who will come in at such and such a valuation. Oh, by the way, we have this small print which says that, you know, we get anti-whatever, dilution preferences, just in condition after condition after condition. And after a while, Bob Metcalf, you know, gave up, went back to the West Coast VCs, did a deal in about half an hour and went ahead with his company. I love that. Yeah, and, and went back to the New York firms and they then said, why didn't you take our money? We were there when no one else were. And I remember in your book that you say that Metcalf then said, no, you lied to me. <laughs> you, did, you didn't help me. You lied to me. That's right. I can only say to our listeners that this book is so full of anecdotes of stories of the fabled companies and fabled persons that everyone needs to go in and read it. Honestly, I think that it is both hilarious and also incredibly informative. So thanks a million for the book, Sebastian. Now let's jump into some quotes from the book. I think that It's funny to focus the conversation around these personalities and then let you draw inferences from them. So I think we should start with Vinod Khosla. He has said, most people think improbable ideas are unimportant. The only thing that's important is something that is improbable. Yeah. Well, Vinod Khosla said this to me. I remember we had a very long conversation. And it was partly about his investment in impossible foods, which was, you know, as its name suggested... One of those improbable ideas that you could make a hamburger that really did smell and look like a real hamburger, down to the point where you could put it on a barbecue and, you know, sort of red juices would drop onto the grill and turn brown and make that satisfying sort of slightly acrid smell. The guy who was proposing to do this was a, you know, famous geneticist, but he was not somebody who'd ever made a food product before nor had he actually started a company. So the whole thing seemed super impossible. And that's why Vino Costa liked it, because it was one of those ideas which was so out of left field that if you made it work, there would be big barriers to entry, a big moat. It was one of those low probability but very high outcome classic power law bets. And so he was just talking about this, and he just suddenly came up with this phrase. Most people think that the improbable doesn't matter But that's the only thing that matters. And one can extend this phrase, by the way, out of venture and into kind of other parts of life. If you think about the way that stock market investors behave, they basically are looking at the probable outcomes for most of the time because the tails are not totally thin. Of course, famously, they are not. That's why we have financial crashes. To a first approximation, they're pretty thin. So these real outlier events, and I did the math on this and looked at how often it does happen that you get fluctuations of, say, more than 3% from where the index began in the morning. How often does it move more than 3%? It's remarkably infrequent, okay? But in venture, of course, you only care about the tail of the distribution. That's the whole point of the power law. Yeah. And so it's just a fundamentally different way of coming at the world. And that's why I chose that quotation, because it captures the essence of venture capital. I have uh, another one here that on a first sight, I'd say it sounds extremely counterintuitive, <laughs> as I'm very curious to hear, which is by Matt Clifford, which is Silicon Valley is gripped by the cult of the individual. But those individuals represent the triumph of the network. Yeah. So, you know, venture capital... Often, but not, I mean, not, this is slightly an unfair generalization, but there's a huge element of individualism in it, right? So partners go off, they try to make deals. Of course, they check in with their own VC partners. They go to the Monday partners meetings. They discuss these deals. They vote on them together. So there's teamwork. And actually, I argue in my book that the teamwork often differentiates the successful partnerships from the unsuccessful ones. But there's a lot of individual stuff going on. And ultimately, you do the investment You lead it, and you go on the board, and you got to deal with the individual CEO who you're backing, the founder you're backing. You know, you look at the Forbes Midas list, it's very much perceived to be this culture of the individual. But 
Matt Clifford's point when he says, you know, it's Silicon Valley is gripped by the cult of the individual, but those individuals represent the triumph of the network. You know, it gets to this thing I was talking about earlier where, you know, venture capital is the guardian of this super creative cluster in Silicon Valley or in other tech clusters that have emerged since Silicon Valley. That's, I think, really explaining where innovation comes from. If you look at why, you know, again, going back to this question of Boston versus Silicon Valley, you know, one point I didn't make earlier is that economists tend to look at clusters and they say, okay, just putting a lot of people who do the same thing in one place is good. It could be movies in Hollywood. It could be finance in New York. It could be tech in Silicon Valley. And it's good because you get more precise matching between employers and skills. So a company wants a particular kind of database engineer, and you need a deep pool of workers to choose from so you get exactly the right kind of database engineer. That's why clusters are productive. But that sort of story simply doesn't tell you why one cluster, which is the same size as another cluster, could outperform. And the reason it outperforms is because in some clusters, there's a network that circulates ideas and money and people around the network in a super creative and productive and inventive way. And I think that's what distinguishes Silicon Valley. I argue that the people who are incentivized to circulate talent and ideas and money, these people are the venture capitalists. I mean, VCs are incentivized to get up in the morning and have breakfast with one person and have 14 meetings before they go to bed. Why? Because obviously they're looking for the next founder they might back or the, the five engineers that may, might be hired into the startup they backed last week. You know, you know the story. So it's that massive networking that makes clusters really productive. And that's what Matt Clifford is getting at in that quotation. Now for the next one, it is from Mike Morris from Sequoia. And he says, the great challenge at venture partnerships is that the principles must refrain from killing each other. Yes. Well, Michael Moritz of Sequoia is really... Um, immensely quotable. He's constantly <laughs> saying things <laughs> that I couldn't resist putting in the book. Um, one of my favorites is when he described Masayoshi Son, who he absolutely hated. <laughs> Not to put a too fine a point on it. Uh, uh, he compared him to Kim Jong-il of uh, North Korea. I don't know if he really wanted me to quote that, but he did give me an internal memo, or actually several internal memos, that he wrote to his Sequoia partners, and uh, it included this line, and he said I could quote from the memos, so hey. <laughs> so this is another Michael Moritzism. You know, the great challenge of venture partnerships is that the principles must refrain from killing each other. The immediate context for this quote is that when Sequoia moved into China, it hired two people to set up the China business. After about four years, it did seem rather as though one of them might be trying to kill the other one. <laughs> And Moritz got a call when he was in California one weekend from these two who were kind of calling him together. And they were evidently, you know, not getting along at all well. And he flew straight away to China to sort this out. And shortly thereafter, one of them left Sequoia. Yeah. And the other one, Neil Shen, stayed and, of course, has become famous as the top VC globally. But it's that maintenance of the internal culture of a partnership, which is really the threshold test you have to survive when you are doing venture capital. Another very interesting quote here from a well-famed organization in the venture space, Y Combinator, this is by Paul Graham, which is spend as little as you can because every dollar of the investor's money you get will be taken out of your ass. <laughs> yes. Well, again, Paul Graham is super quotable, an absolutely genius writer and wonderful analyst of everything in Silicon Valley and tech. And so here's a great quote from him. You know, every dollar of the investor's money you get will be taken out of your ass. Yeah, this was him in the period around 2004, maybe early 2005, right before he set up Y Combinator, before he sort of became an investor. He was pretty unfriendly to the investment establishment. <laughs> you know, he also propounded something that he called the universal theory of VC suckage. <laughs> and this was the period, you know, 2004, 2005, when there was stirring what I call the youth revolt, where the very young Mark Zuckerberg showed up at Sequoia to pitch his company. 
He refused to pitch Facebook, which of course is what Sequoia wanted to hear about, and deliberately annoyed them by showing up late, number one, showing up in his pajamas, number two, pitching a different side company called Wirehog, number three, and saying, here's my pitch deck, these are the 10 reasons why you should not invest in me. Reason number two, by the way, was that I showed up in my pajamas. So this was a highly premeditated snub. And, you know, along with Paul Graham's quote here, it kind of captured that spirit of the moment when young coders didn't need very much capital. And therefore, entrepreneurs and coders, hackers, in Paul Graham's language, you know, their reaction was, we don't need that much capital. Don't take too much capital because every dollar you take will be taken right out of your ass. And so, you know, give us a new system here where we don't get that much capital, but we don't give you that much equity. And we're going to flip the tables on you guys, you venture investors. And it's going to be the era of deferring to founders, founder friendliness, and uh, the funders will have to come second. This is so fun. Final quote. This is Intel Sandy Grove saying to John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins, John, venture capital, that's not a real job. It's like being a real estate agent. Yeah, like being a real estate agent. I mean, I put that in because, of course, there is plenty of commentary out there to the effect that venture capitalists are useless. You know, they don't do anything. They just show up for success. They don't create it. All they do is they embed themselves in the network and they extract value, but really... It's sort of, you know, blood sucking. And you, know, you can't write a book about venture capital without reckoning with that point of view because it's a pretty widely held view, including in this quotation by, you know, the guy who was the chief executive of Intel. So not a bit player. <laughs> yeah. I put that quote in just to reflect the full range of views on VC. It's not obviously where I come out in the book, but one has to deal with it. No, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the history of VC and a lot of this is reflected in your book, but there's a question that we must ask, right? Which is after going through this exercise of writing this book and really deep diving into all these stories, all these insights, where do you personally see VC headed from here on? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, my view is that we are in a bit of a bubble right now, but that the bubble is less important than the secular trend. And the secular trend is that VC is spreading in three dimensions. You know, it's going global. It's spreading into new kinds of technology. And it's spread along the life cycle of companies so that companies go public later than they used to. And that's not going away. And the reason it's not going away is that VC is just awesomely effective at identifying, backing, and nurturing the most important kind of company out there, which is a company that is basically doing intangible capital. I mean, people say, oh, it's a tech company. I think an equally useful framing is to say, this is about intangibles. It's about the intangible economy. We've moved from a world in which basically capital is something that you can drop on your foot, you know, it's a physical thing, mm -hmm. to a world in which it's ideas, it's a business process, it's intellectual property, it's software. It's all this intellectual output which is difficult to value in a financial statement because you say, oh, I put three million into my software development project. Well, cool. But is it worth zero because it sucks? Or is it worth like, you know, never mind the three million you put in, it might be worth three billion, right? If it's an awesome piece of code. The only way you can tell what it's worth is if you actually are pretty close to the company, you're on the board maybe, you understand something about coding yourself. So you've got to be that hands-on investor. And venture capitalists, that is what they do. And that's why I think that venture capital going into the future is just going to keep on spreading. It's going to be a bigger and bigger deal in Europe. It's going to be a bigger deal in Latin America. It's going to be a bigger deal in the United States, but not just in Silicon Valley. It's going to spread. So I'm super bullish on the sector. And I think that the natural question to follow up with here is this spread it will be to some extent contingent on the ability to replicate the success of Silicon Valley and thus also what has created the success of Silicon Valley. I'm curious to hear how you think that the rest of the world should go about basically adopting best practices, but also creating the next generation of venture capital. You know, the good news from my book is that venture capital is sort of a, a super effective mechanism for getting entrepreneurship off the ground. And 
once you've understood how that works, and I think it's pretty widely understood now, and hopefully, you know, I'm helping to propagate it. <laughs> um, once it's understood, you can spread it globally, and that's exactly what's happening right now. So, you know, Sequoia goes from Silicon Valley, opens an office in China, office, office, you know, another one in India. Now it's got an office in Europe. You look at General Catalyst, Lightspeed, Excel, these guys coming to Europe. I think this thing is spreading. And once you've got a place, take Europe again, which has a large amount of technically educated people in a big consumer market, and then you add in these VCs who will underwrite risk and then nurture companies and mentor founders, I think the government just has to do a couple of things and they're not that difficult. The first one is, for goodness sake, fix any taxes on employee stock options. I mean, there are still a few places where you have this dry tax. The moment you issue an employee stock option, there's a tax that's due at the time of issuance. I mean, that's complete nonsense. You've got to be taxed when the thing is exercised and it's actually valuable, not when it's just granted when you've got no money to pay the tax with. So that's one thing. I think you've got to do something about worker mobility. So California does not enforce non-compete contracts except to a very limited degree. And so countries that make it difficult for engineers to move from one company to another need to fix that, and they need to reduce the gardening leave to preferably zero, but, you know, one month or something. Just think about it. A startup raises money. It's got a six- to nine-month runway. It has this awesome person to come and join, and then the awesome person can't show up for six months. I mean, that's terrible. Yeah. So I, I'd say those are the two main things that need to be fixed in terms of policy. We always like to end the episodes with a quick fire round, and it's time for it because we're running out of time. The quick fire round is a final bit with quick answer questions, 30 to 60 seconds each. Are you ready, Sebastian? Yes. Awesome. First question, which is actually two question into one, which is what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about VC? And it's two questions because I'm asking from an insider's view, from the VC's view, but also from the general public's view. I think the biggest misconception is the sort of founding idea in Andreessen Horowitz, which is that you have to be a former entrepreneur to be a great VC. And that's simply a dangerous generalization. Outside venture capital, there's a perception that it's purely spray and pray. It's just luck. And I think I demonstrate fairly conclusively that that's just wrong. Hopefully, we've played a role in that as well <laughs> over the, the episodes we've done so far. <laughs> Second question, what would be your book recommendation for other VCs to read? And here, I'll ask you to please not recommend your own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apart from my own, I think a great classic I came across as I was doing my research is by Jerry Kaplan, who was an entrepreneur in the Valley in the 90s. His book is called Startup, a Silicon Valley adventure, and it was reprinted in 1996, so it was written sometime in the 90s. It's basically about John Doerr backing a Palm computer sort of early tablet, and the whole company goes completely wrong. It's just a hilarious story. Final question is quick for a round, which is what can we expect in the future from you, Sebastian, in the VC space? Well, I'm going to start writing a weekly column for the Washington Post newspaper. And I don't know if it'll be all about VC, but it'll include VC and tech and startups. So that's my next project. Thanks so much for joining us, Sebastian. And thanks so much for writing the book. I think it will be a bestseller. It's amazing. I can only say that I've had so much fun there. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. And it's great to be with both of you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors.